All right, I got kind of a very interesting subject to talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ about. And of course, atheists and Muslims and Catholics and whoever else wants to watch, you can too. But uh, a lot of you aren't going to get it because this is spiritual discernment stuff. But a um, little while ago, uh, Sister Sally over at Heal and Restore, her channel there, she sent me a link to this video. I'm going to put it down in the description box. It's about the actual location of where the third temple is supposed to be in Jerusalem. And uh, for years and years and years, I have been parroting the teaching that the Temple Mount is over there in Jerusalem, This, the Wailing Wall, the Kotal, and all that stuff, you know, and they, they where the Jews, different, all the different sects of it and everything else, they're over there and they're, they're, you know, doing their prayers and they're putting little papers into the cracks between the rocks, the whole deal. I'm sure you've seen pictures. I'm, I'm going to be throwing pictures into this whole study and stuff, so... But, uh, you know, we've all seen the pictures, and I've been teaching that that is the foundations of the, you know, second temple, and that's where they need to be rebuild the third temple. And this documentary, they talk to a bunch of different people and experts in the field and whatnot, and they basically prove that, no, that's actually not the location that the temple was never there, the second temple. It's actually down lower in the city of David area. It's, it's not in that, on that spot. That spot there, the wall that you see that everybody prays in front of and everything else, is actually Fort Antonia. It's a Roman fort. And, um, you know, I went into the video and I was totally skeptical. I was just like, I'm going to go into this thing and I'm going to be the biggest skeptic that there ever was. I'm not going to believe what these guys are saying. Watched the video and I came out going, yep, okay, <laughs> I'm convinced. Uh, yeah, the Temple Mount. Uh, the, excuse me, the, the actual temple that should be built um, should not be built on the Temple Mount, the current, what they call the Temple Mount there, with the Mosque of Omar, or the Dome of the Rock, whatever you want to call that Muslim structure. Um, so where do I believe that the, now that I've seen that evidence, where do I believe the third temple is going to be built? I believe it's going to be built on the Temple Mount at the Mosque of Omar, or right around that area. What? Isn't that contradiction? No, because there are some very serious reasons why they are going to build it. And I don't mean the Jews. It's not going to be a third temple for the Jews. It's going to be for the Roman Catholics. You see, because Roman Catholicism controls the city of Jerusalem. All right. I'm going to offer some very interesting little insights, so to speak, uh, in this study here. And I want your input. Um... I'm very anxious to see, because I'm going to be questioning some very traditional teachings, things that I've taught for years. But the Lord's really been opening my eyes with a lot of this stuff, and, and I just, I have, I have just put away answering people's emails. I mean, I'm just, I'm not doing very much else other than just studying this subject. I've been just pouring over this subject now for the last number of days, going over this thing and just praying, saying, Lord, you know, what does your word teach? And... I want your input. I wrote down, I just grabbed a, an old tablet here. I don't. I didn't even organize this thing, so thoughts might be a little bit jumbled, but I want to go over some of this stuff, okay? Different points I'm going to make. Number one, the Temple Mount is actually the Roman Fort Antonia. Yeah. So who really has claim to that fort? The Catholics. Ancient pagan Roman, the Roman Empire, Went into, you know, went from the big Roman Empire, broke into two different kingdoms, and then eventually merged and became the Roman Catholic Church under Constantine, I believe it was. That's historical fact. Imperial Rome became the Roman Catholic Church. That's why you have Pontificus Maximus, right? The, another name for the Pope it was also a name for Caesar. Point number two: Roman Catholicism has the true rights to build on the Temple Mount. They do. They're the ones that have the claim of antiquity. The, the Jews say, well, no, but it was our second temple. The second temple was never there. It never sat on that spot. You know, watch that documentary. They prove it. That the second Jewish temple never sat there on Fort Antonia. Right? And the Muslims certainly don't have any rights to have their Mosque of Omar there. They have no rights. Point number three. Fort Antonia and the Third Temple, 
perfectly represents the papal system of temporal spiritual power. Uh, I'm not sure if I can find the thing here quickly. Uh, let me just see if I can find it while I'm talking. Um, in Roman Catholicism, they teach that the Catholic Church has two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Of course, the spiritual sword would be the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, they would call it, the sacred scriptures, whatever. Um, whereas the temporal sword means that they have the right to rule over kings. Yeah, I don't have the thing here with me now. I'm probably I'm going to be bringing out more information on this. You know, I'm going to try to keep this um, fairly short. Uh, this is the whole book of anathemas from the Jesuit fathers. Um, I have in my collection. Uh, found this at a used bookstore many years ago. Been a good find. Um, yeah, it's talking about marriages there, matrimony. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I could find it here. I know that there's, here it is, you know, church teaches by Jesuit fathers. So, not making it up. People get, you know, all excited and stuff and say I'm conspiratorial because I talk about Jesuits and things. Well, I have the sources to prove it, so whatever. But the Vatican believes that they have both the right to rule over all religions and also all political powers. All right, and that's going to be very important, you know, to remember for the future. Again, if you're a Muslim or if you're anything other than Roman Catholic uh, or atheist, whatever else, um, you're going to be looking at a future of forced conversion. Doubt it not. Number four, point number four, Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. We're going to read that here. Um, mentions some, something very interesting. We're going to start out actually in Matthew chapter 11, your King James Bible. And get a very important concept here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. All right. This is a reference to Jerusalem, the city of the great king. All right. You can go back to Matthew chapter 5. I'll show you that. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 35. It says here, well, it started verse 34. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. All right, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. People say, well, that's where God dwells. Okay, when did anybody take God's realm there, heaven? When did anybody take it by force? Never. Nobody's going to take it by force. You say, well, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual fellowship, just like the same thing as the kingdom of God. Uh, no, the kingdom of God is, is within us as Christians. You know, peace, joy, righteousness. Okay. How are you going to take that by force? No, what this talk is talking about, Matthew 11, verse 12, is talking about the physical kingdom whose headquarter is Jerusalem. That's what's going on there. But look at Matthew chapter 13. This is rather interesting. Matthew chapter 13, kind of an interesting number, verse 33. And the Bible does have a system of numbers too, by the way, so don't get excited. I'm not teaching occult numerology. Um, the Bible definitely has a system of numbers. 13 is a, not a good number. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, remember that, is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Then he goes on. But look at the verse. The kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, is like unto leaven. The leaven in Scripture, you know, Jesus warns about the leaven of the Pharisees and things. It's false doctrine. That's what it's talking about there. So the kingdom of heaven, a physical kingdom, is like unto false doctrine, which a woman took. Is there a church out there that calls themselves a Holy Mother Church? Mm -hmm. And if you study the King James Bible, the church is never called a woman. The bride, a chaste virgin, but never a woman. Hmm. But there's a woman back in Revelation chapter 17 that reigns over the kings of the earth. And this woman is a city. It's not Jerusalem. It's the Vatican. 
So this woman, the Vatican, takes false doctrine and messes with the kingdom of heaven. And look what she does. And hid in three measures of meal until the whole, till the whole was leavened. What's going on there? This woman, the Vatican, takes false doctrine and she hides it in three measures of meal until they become one. Till the whole was leavened. Well, now here's the question. What are the three measures of meal? You say, uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and the Orthodox Church. No, because that's not going on over there in the city of the great king. Those groups are there. Many of them are represented in things with organizations there in Jerusalem. But what are the three monotheistic religions? Catholicism, which the media calls Christianity. Catholicism is not Christianity. But let's just go with that for a minute. Catholicism, Judaism, and Islam. That's the three measures of meal that are associated with the physical city of Jerusalem. Look it up. Again, I, you know, I'm not messing around here. You know, the Jews are there. They're saying, hey, we don't want anybody, you know, right now there's all this controversy. You know, we're not going to let any Muslims in towards, you know, to get to the Dome of the Rock. And the Muslims are going, it's our third holiest site. You know, how dare you? We're going to start riots. And Mahmoud Abbas and, and, you know, the Palestinian president, he's saying, calling for days of, of wrath and vengeance and stuff like that. And they're throwing firecrackers and people getting shot and all kinds of stuff like this. And the Catholics are saying, oh, we have our holy shrines there too. Three measures of meal, you see. And the leaven that that woman is sowing is over the identity of where that temple is supposed to be. Because you see that the key to Bible prophecy here is that temple, that city of Jerusalem. If you're going to rule the whole world, you rule it from Jerusalem, not from the Vatican, not from London, not from Washington, D.C., or any other city. One city, the city of the great king, according to Matthew chapter 5, it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. I mean, what other city is seeing so much fighting? Do people fight over so much, so hard for that city? Jerusalem. Hmm. You say, but you see, if we could just come to an agreement. The Catholics have their Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is not very far away from this Temple Mount thing. And the Muslims, they have their Dome of the Rock. And if we could just put the third Jewish temple someplace else, you know, on the, the you know, Temple Mount area, the Fort Antonia. In reality, if you could just put it someplace else, then we could, you know, there wouldn't be the strife there and everything else. But you see, the strife is the point. Divide and conquer. The real power behind the, all the governments of the world, the Vatican, they want strife. That's what they want. Because, you, again, if you are new to this whole thing, the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I can't believe I said that whole thing without getting my tongue all mixed up. You have two opposing systems, create two opposing systems, division, and then you come in and conquer it by saying, let's come together. We have to make compromises. You see? So people have been teaching, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but people have been teaching that the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to bring peace to the Jews and the Muslims. He's going to bring them together and make the peace treaty and the temple's going to get built and the whole deal and stuff. And then there's going to be, you know, the temple's built and the Antichrist can show up and all this stuff. I don't believe that way anymore. After looking at this whole thing, and I'm going to share that with you in this study, and I want your opinions, honestly. I really do. So bringing all three religions together would cause endless strife. That's why, again, the Romans say, hey, it's our Fort Antonia. The Muslims say, no, it's actually where Muhammad went back up to heaven on the um, horse and stuff like this. And the Jews say, yeah, but that's where our third temple belongs. Strife, 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 fighting. It's what you're seeing right now in the news. Uh, number six, point number six. The Daniel 9.27 covenant will be confirmed. Look it up. So we'll go there in just a minute. Between, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's look it up real quick. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Um, 
here's where it gets interesting. Here's my theory, and you know, I just want people's opinion. I'm not saying I'm not teaching this thing as absolute. This is the way it's going to be. But after looking at this thing, this is what I'm starting to think. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. You get these dumb bunnies, these uh, you know replacement theology nuts like Anderson and Tex Mars and some of these others. And they, they say, well, you know, there will be no temple. There's no temple and all this other stuff. There has to be. Bible prophecy said that there would be. The Antichrist is going to set himself up to be worshipped in that temple someday, that rebuilt temple. And he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's why you have the Temple Institute today getting all the stuff ready, the red heifer and the investments and the huge big golden menorah and all this other stuff. They're, they're getting ready. The Temple Institute, again, do a Google search and look and you'll see the Temple Institute's like right beside the whole Fort Antonia thing. The Temple Mount, as it's falsely, you know, called. Um, they're getting ready to build this temple. But they have to build it on that, you know, the, the footing of that Roman fortress. I'm going to explain why here as we continue. But notice it does not say he will sign the covenant. And yet that's what most people say. Again, I've said this stuff in the past. Because I've never really looked at it. I've parroted what I've been taught. But I'm starting to look at this thing and going, wait a second, this is not making sense to me. There were certain things that never made sense and just didn't line up, but I just never looked at it until now. The Lord's been revealing some stuff to me. What does it mean there? He shall confirm the covenant. That means the covenant's already there. And he confirms it. The deal is there. They just need to work out the details. He confirms it. And here's my theory. What if this uh, covenant that's confirmed is not between the Jews and the Muslims? What if it's between the Jews and the Catholics? Huh? Who owns the Temple Mount? Well, the, 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 the nation of Jordan. Well, they are the ones that think that they own it. Maybe they, they think that they have custodial care of that land or whatever else. But uh, let me show you something. Right here... Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right there. This is uh, 1997, 10th of November, 1997. Legal Personality Agreement, State of Israel slash Holy See. Okay? Right there you go. Going down through. I'm going to read it. You can look this up online. It's available. Agreement between the State of Israel and the Holy See. Article 1. This agreement is made on the basis of the provisions of the fundamental agreement between the State of Israel and the Holy See, Roman Catholicism, in other words, which was signed on 30th of December 1993 and then entered into force on 10th of March 1994, here and after the fundamental agreement. Article 2, recalling that the Holy See is the sovereign authority of the Catholic Church, the State of Israel agrees to ensure full effect in Israeli law to the legal personality of the Catholic Church itself. Article number three, the State of Israel agrees to assure full effect in Israeli law in accordance with the provisions of this agreement to the legal personality of the following. It lists a whole bunch of Catholic churches. I didn't even get through this whole document. But the nation of Israel giving, granting the Catholic Church rights to the land. It was called the Oslo Agreement, is what the thing was called. I believe it was 1990. Two, I think it was, and then 93, it was when it was, you know, all ratified and everything else, where you had Shimon Perez, and he basically gave, you know, the Holy Lands there, the, the city of Jerusalem, he gave it to the Vatican to be made into an international city. And right now, they're still trying to iron out the details. The Jews are going, yeah, but if, you know, if we just, if we build our temple up there, then, you know, you're going to, you're going to say you're saying it's going to be open to all the people and things. Anybody can come into the Jewish temple. Well, that would defile it and whatever else. And the Catholics are going, yeah, but it's our land. We can give it to you. They're hashing this thing out. Think about that one, brethren. It's not going to be a peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims. The Antichrist confirms the covenant that's already there. How close are we to the rapture again? 
Whoa. Hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have all this stuff worked out. I'm just like bursting with this information. I'm just like, you know what? I need to get this video out. I need to get it on just out there. And I want your input to, to hey, brother, I, what about this? What about that? I mean, please answer something. Those of you that are saying, oh, I don't know about this. Where in the book of Daniel, where in the Bible does it say anything about Jews and Muslims signing an agreement? Show it to me. It's an assumption. Say, well, you know, Isaac and Ishmael and their descendants. And stuff. Sure, sure. I understand that. But where does it say that they're signing a peace treaty? A covenant is confirmed. Daniel 9, 27. That's what the Bible says. Point number seven. The Antichrist will begin a crusade and conquer the Muslim nations by mass murder. By peace, he will destroy many. The Bible says about that back in the book of Daniel. I believe that part of the deal between the Jews and the Catholics is the destruction and the wiping out of the Muslim nations. I believe that. We'll get more into that as we continue. The time of Jacob's trouble begins only when the Antichrist confirms the covenant. What am I saying? Uh, well, could the Antichrist show up and be on the earth, going out conquering and to conquer, before he confirms the covenant? Again, what does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 6, the Lord unleashes him, and we're in heaven before this happens too, by the way. Again, how close is the rapture? Think about that. The Lord unleashes the Antichrist and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. It doesn't say he confirms the covenant. It could happen years after he's out there conquering and to conquer. And again, I believe part of my theory is that I brought out another video. The rapture could be blamed on radical Islam. You get a bunch of Christians that just didn't disappear and there's cars careening off and slamming into things and children are all gone and whatever else. They could blame that thing on radical Islam and people would just turn into just like sharks with a feeding frenzy just going after the Muslims. If you're a Muslim, you better think about that. You think the Catholic Church, you know, oh, well, we're kind of getting along with them and stuff. What do you think the whole uh, integration thing is all about? The whole immigrant thing is just moving Muslims all over the place. They're setting you up for the kill. That's why. They're going to do things to Islam that's going to make Muslims angry. They're going to go out and start attacking people. And then the Catholic Church is just going to go and just flip. And I'm going to show you it's in Roman Catholic writings that this would eventually happen. A mass slaughter of all Muslims by a crowned and conquering king of Catholicism. I'm going to show you from their writings. Again, the Lord showed me this thing. You know, doing research and just like the Lord puts stuff into my mind. Hey, check this out. Check that out. And I look it up and... <gasps> Whoa, it's confirming what I'm feeling. Let's continue. Number nine, point number nine. The Jews believe that their Messiah can't show up until the third temple is built. That's what they're saying. That's why the Jews are so excited to build this temple. And they're like, just go, we want to build the temple, you know, when they want the temple mount. But that pesky old Muslim mosque is there, the Dome of the Rock. And, that you know, it's like we want to destroy that thing and all this stuff. And, you know, people say, well, there's plenty of room up there. They could build it someplace else. And there was a, this Google image thing or Google Maps or whatever. And uh, Google Earth, I guess it was. And they, you know, showed the, the third temple kind of over to the side of the Dome of the Rock. And that might still happen. You know, it could still happen. But think about the divide and conquer thing if behind the scenes the Catholics destroy the Dome of the Rock. I'm going to show you some more interesting stuff on that too as we continue here. Really interesting stuff. But turn in your Bible to Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. Um, the Jews are, are teaching right now, uh, and I, I'm a supporter of the Jews' right to be there in the land. I don't support a lot of the things that they are doing. I think that the Jews are very wicked. They reject Jesus Christ. Um, for my Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ out there, well, I love you very much. Um, and I love the Jewish people. I'd like to see them get saved. But Jesus is your Messiah. And if you don't put your faith in Him, you're going to die and go to hell and burn. 
just as simple as that. So um, when I'm ripping on Israel, I'm not saying that I hate Jews and they have no right to the land. They have every right to the land because uh, the Bible says so. Okay, But you need to understand, the Jews right now are wicked. They're in unbelief. Zechariah chapter 6, verses uh, 12 through 15. Let's read that quick. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. It's a reference to the Messiah there, which obviously is Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Wait a second. I thought the Jews today are saying, We need to build the temple so the Messiah can come. But this scripture right here says plainly, that when the Messiah comes, He builds the temple. What on earth are you doing building one so He can show up? Hmm. Verse 13, Even He shall build the temple of the Lord, and He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon His throne. He builds it, and then He sits in, on the throne and rules from it. And He shall be a priest upon His throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crowns shall be to... Helam, and to, to, and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Hen the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass, if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So the Lord is building the, the Messiah there. He is building the temple, but there's also people coming and taking part in that construction process. But the whole point I'm trying to make is the Jews of today in Israel right now, the Temple Institute and all that stuff, I know they mean well. You know, some of them, I think there, you know, there's probably some papal Masonic connections there, you know, in the higher up levels and things like that. Again, I don't hate them because of that. Just as I don't hate Roman Catholic Jesuits or Knights Templar or Knights of the Equestrian Order or whatever. They can get saved. But if they don't want to get saved, then they're wicked. They're going to burn in hell. Same thing for the Jews. And this Temple Institute thing, well, we got to build the temple so our Messiah can come. You don't know Scripture. You don't know your own book, the Old Testament there. Okay? So, uh, that's important to understand that. But, continuing here, let me go over some more of the points that I just quickly wrote down. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 makes it crystal clear that there will be only one religion allowed in the time of Jacob's trouble. The whole world worships the beast. So it's not this ecumenical thing. That is a smokescreen that the Catholic Church is creating. Again, the ecumenical council, Vatican II, all that stuff. Who created the ecumenical movement? Roman Catholicism. All right? It's right there. Roman Catholicism will be the one world religion, not a nice religion of all tolerance and everything else. I mean, again... How do you control the world when everybody gets to do their own thing? You can't. You need to have a totalitarian religion, a fascist religion, to control the entire world. It's going to be Roman Catholicism. And again, oh, well, you know, but we could coexist with Muslims. No, you can't. Some Muslims can kind of, they're wishy-washy enough that they could maybe get along with some Catholics. But the real ones... They know that they can't get along with Catholics, and Catholics can't get along with Muslims, and they both can't get along with the Jews. Next point. The Antichrist Pope sets himself up to be worshipped in this pagan third temple and causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Yeah, what the Bible says is going to happen. So if you deny it, well, I don't think it's going to... Okay, then Scripture can't be fulfilled. There will be a third temple, and it will be a Roman temple you know, that the Jews are allowed to use, thinking that, oh, the Romans, you know, they've signed, we've confirmed this covenant that, you know, started with the Oslo Agreement. And, you know, you had Shimon Perez there too. I don't know if I, I don't think I said this before, but he was actually knighted in 2008 after giving his lands. You know, 10 years later, over 10 years later, he's knighted by the Pope. Or no, I guess it was maybe by the Queen or whatever, but it was a Catholic knighthood. Queen of England, I think, or something like that. Okay, point number 13. Because I know some of you are, are big into the whole UFO thing. You say, yeah, but brother, I think that UFOs are going to be the big explanation for the rapture. Not so much an Islamic whatever else and things. Uh, how would you explain the UFO phenomena? Well, the way that it's already been explained. 
um, Marian apparitions. Again, I forget if it was Fatima or Lourdes or what one of them, but I remember there were like hundreds of Catholics outside and they saw, they said that God performed this miracle or Mary or whoever performed this miracle of making the sun, you know, fly around the sky like this. They're already seeing UFOs, the Catholics. So again, UFOs show up after the rapture. They'll just do some kind of Catholic manifestation, look like the communion host up there in the sky and the Catholics will be gone. Ah, you know, what should we do, God? You know, and they can beam into their minds, you know, with that, some of the technology that they have and whatever, you know, surpassing the conscious mind and into the subconscious mind. And, you know, they say it vibrates the cartilage in between the two halves of the brain. I mean, again, look this up. This stuff, there's patents for this technology. Okay. Um, some of the harp stuff and whatever else. I mean, it's weird stuff, I realize, but it's there if you do the research. But, you know, it bypasses, you can't see, like right now you see me talking to you, you hear my voice. But if I could all of a sudden just, and you hear my voice inside your head, you know, it's like, well, you know. But see, they could do UFO stuff and beam stuff into the Catholics' heads and just go, kill every Muslim. You know, and down, there they go. It's funny, too, because Jesus Christ said, about the time will come when they that kill you will think that they do God's service. Ad majorium de glorium, for the greater glory of God, the Jesuit motto. Hmm. You know, the Catholic uh, slogan for the military, for God and country. They that kill you will think that they do God's service. What about Islam? Well, again, you can do the study. Islam comes from Roman Catholicism. And why? Well, you go into that whole thing. Again, the Catholics fighting with the Jews all the time. They created Islam to further fight with the Jews. Islam kind of got out of control, started kicking back to the Catholics, and so they've been doing the Crusades and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's about the Catholics and the Jews, not the Jews and the Muslims, you see. Number 14, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, also called the pre-trib rapture, will be blamed on Islam and they will be slaughtered by, by angry Catholics. Again, I talked about that earlier. You get a bunch of Catholic children disappearing, which I believe the children under the age of accountability, those that are too young, too young to understand, hey, I've sinned against a holy, righteous God. Those children, I believe, are going at the rapture. So you get a bunch of Catholic you know, women and stuff and their babies are gone. You know, well, they blame it on Islam. Again, remember 9-11, and there was, uh, people were putting up signs, you know, uh, my tax dollars bought nukes, you know, use them and stuff. And that was just 3,000 people that were killed there on September 11th. What about when millions disappear, and then there's ensuing deaths as a result of the quick, I shouldn't say millions disappear, a few hundred thousand maybe, <laughs> uh, Christians disappear, and then there's the ensuing deaths that come as a result of the chaos after that. I think it's going to be blamed on Islam. Could I be wrong? Sure. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Number 15. Jews and Muslims cannot sign a peace treaty because the Jews have nothing but their land to offer Palestine. Islam must go for the system to work. Again, think about this. This is something that's always kind of bothered me. Okay. We're going to have the Antichrist is going to show up and there's going to be the two-state plan, the two-state solution. They're talking about this thing in the news all the time. Jared Kushner, you know, Trump's saying, I'm going to have my son-in-law work out this deal. That, that kid's too big of a sissy. I'm sorry. He just looks like he just got done playing video games whenever you see him walking through or whatever else. News conference, he just, yeah. he's not going to do any kind of peace plan, whatever else. It's a smokescreen, people. You know? Give me a break. Uh, you know, there's not going to be this two-state plan. I mean, again... The, the Jews say, hey, we want the Temple Mount to build our temple. We need to get rid of the Mosque of Omar. We need to wipe that thing out. They, you know, the Jews are putting up you know, metal detectors and the Muslims are flipping out about it. How on earth are the Jews ever going to get to a point where they can say, hey, just sign here and so we get to bulldoze your, your temple down? Or even if it falls down a natural disaster, we're going to build our Jewish third temple there. Could you sign there, please? You know, the Muslims are going to go, oh, sure, yeah, that sounds good. They're going to want something in return. What do the Muslims want in return? 
right now. What do they want from the Jews? They want them off the land. They call it the illegal occupation of the nation of Israel. This is our land. This, is, this long land belongs to the Palestinians. I mean, what else, does, what else does Israel, the nation of Israel, have to give to the Muslim nations? You say lots of money. The Muslim nations have plenty of money. They're doing fine. Israeli technology. They don't need the Israeli technology. They get a lot of the technology from Russia and China. These Islamic countries. Iran and, you know, some of the others. They don't need anything from Israel. So how can you have a peace plan, a peace treaty, a two-state solution where both Jews and Muslims are going to sign their name to it? It's not going to happen. The covenant that's confirmed is between the Jews and Catholicism. It's the Catholic's fort. You know, and the Jews, what's the little carrot that the Catholics dangle in front of the eyes of the Jews? How about, we'll wipe out all the Muslim nations. Hmm, and the Jews are sitting there going, oh, okay, I'll have to think about this. Okay. Number 16. Point number 16. The Jews building on the Catholic Fort Antonia site will be another denial of Jesus' words in Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Just in case you aren't aware of the scriptures here. And this was the big sell for me when I watched that documentary about where's the actual temple located. Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Wait a second. Is the Temple Mount really the site of the temple? There's a big wall there. Well, if that's the real site, then Jesus was a liar. Again, think about the Jews that are wicked that want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. By building on the Temple Mount, Fort Antonia there, they are literally saying that Jesus Christ lied in Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. He said that there's not going to be left here one stone upon another, but the wall is still there. And, you know, they prove again, conclusively prove in that documentary that the actual temple down in the city of David, there was not a single stone left upon another. But Fort Antonia, where the Romans soldiers came from, you know, rearming and everything else there that was still there, you know, when Titus sacked Jerusalem, Fort Antonia was left standing. Maybe sustained a little bit of damage in some of the fighting, but the whole point is the fort's still there. The Roman fort. That's not the Temple Mount. But you get Jews that are wicked and that hate Jesus Christ, and there's some real wicked ones too, by the way. I've seen some of the stuff these rabbis put out. There's some that hate Jesus Christ with a passion. By them saying this is the Temple Mount and teaching people that, it's another way for them to blaspheme Jesus Christ. And say, oh, Jesus was wrong. He didn't know what he was talking about. He, he tried to prophesy that there wouldn't be another one stone left upon another. Well, he's a liar. Why? We have the whole Western Wall to prove that Jesus lied. Yep. Number 17. The Jews proclaimed that they had no king but Caesar in John chapter 19, verse 15. Look it up. Is that going to be true in the future? The Jewish leaders, I should say it that way. They said that. We have no king but Caesar. And you see Rabbi, I think it's Arthur Schneier or something down in New York uh, City, and he accepted a, case, uh, a papal knighthood a number of years ago. Holocaust survivor. And he's accepting a papal knighthood. Why? Has no king but Caesar. Rome. Caesar is now the Pope. Number 18. The Oslo Accord signed between Shimon Peres and the Vatican in 1993 gave Jerusalem to the Vatican. Absolutely true. Again, you know, the, the numbers I think were like 60% of Jerusalem is now Vatican real estate. And some say even higher than that now. All right. Again, Shimon Perez was knighted by the Pope in 2008. Um, another point here, restoration of the Dome of the Rock was carried out, and this is very interesting, in 1992 by a Northern Ireland company named Mivon. The company is now owned by a Northern Irish Roman Catholic named Brian McConville, the MJM Group. 
Okay. Again, you can do the research. He was on some morning program and the guy asked him, are you a man of faith or religious at all? And he said, well, yeah, I'm a Roman Catholic, this Brian McConville guy. Why would a Northern Irish company be the one who does the renovations on the Dome of the Rock? The company's now owned by Roman Catholics. I couldn't, I couldn't tell if this uh, Mivan thing there, uh, the guy that was originally the founder of that, I couldn't tell if he was Roman Catholic or not. Couldn't find out the information on that. But again, who's in control of the Dome of the Rock? Say the Muslims, okay, why are they going to Northern Ireland for a construction company to work on the Dome of the Rock? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, think about that. Think about something else. The whole Trade Towers thing, the 9-11 deal. Uh, there were stories of, of people saying that uh, there was maintenance being done on the towers in the weeks prior to the towers being brought down and they were brought down by explosives that was not because the airplanes hitting them and then they fell at free fall nearly free fall speed down it was explosives i mean give me a break but what was going on there again you can do the study into this whole thing uh can't think of the guy's name right now um it was actually a jewish guy uh that um silverstein silverstein something can't think of his name first name but he was the one that that took over the you know, the lease or whatever of the trade towers. And the trade towers had asbestos in them and a whole bunch of other stuff. It was going to cost a lot of money to restore those two towers. And so the Silverstein, Larry Silverstein, I think his name was, he came out and he took out this huge big insurance policy just prior, I think it might have been weeks or months or something prior to what happened on 9-11. So the two towers, when they come down and everything. Now all the firefighters are dying of all kinds of lung conditions and everything, breathing in all that insulation, toxic insulation. Um, again, if you, you know, asbestos is a really toxic thing. I mean, it could breathe it in and it will actually eat away some of the cartilage back in your nose. Um, it's nasty stuff. And the firefighters, you know, poor guys up in New York or down in New York, um, you know, they, they breathe that stuff in and they're dying just like flies right now very sad for them but the towers are brought down and Silverstein comes away very rich big insurance policy um, what would happen if they're going to plan the same thing with the Dome of the Rock you get a basically an Irish Roman Catholic construction company that's fixing the Dome of the Rock up get up in there and just kind of rig some uh, you know, thermite or some C4 or whatever else at the right moment, boom, blow it up. And the Muslim world blows up as well and goes crazy. Rapture happens in the midst of all that. Again, gets blamed on Islam. Apparitions of Mary show up in the sky. Could be some pretty crazy times. You know, I mean, you read the book of Revelation, you're going like, man, it seems so different from the world we current live, currently live in. Yeah, but you throw these events in there, you know, and I mean, there's even talk of Mecca and Medina, you know, they could blow them things up too. You know, imagine the Islamic world. They'd go crazy. They'd go nuts trying to kill all the infidels and everything else. And see, again, back centuries ago with the Crusades, you had, you know, here comes Mr. Muslim with his saber here comes Mr. Catholic Crusader with his sword. It's man against man. You know, stronger survive, <laughs> you know. But what do we have now? High-tech weaponry controlled by the Catholics. Much, much greater power militarily, higher technology. They can go into countries and just obliterate the people, just wipe them out and never set foot in that country. Things have changed a bit. The uh, Catholic Crusades that have been going on in the Middle East over there since the whole 9-11 thing, um, a lot of uh, Arabic people have died as a result. Many Muslims have died. You know, I'm no fan of Islam. Don't get me wrong. I'm definitely not a fan of Islam. But uh, these wars that have been going on over there, uh, there's a lot of innocent people that have been killed as a result of those wars. And it's just the beginning. 
But let's continue. I saw years ago, another point here, I saw this thing, there was this black ops soldier and he was like, you know, in this, all this, you know, raised in the deep underground military bases, the dumbs, they actually call it that. And he said that there are only two factions in the world, Zionist Jews and fascist Catholics. I think he's right. I really think he's right. And some of the Jews are kind of, you know, they're, they're not really under the control of the Vatican and stuff, but most are. You get Catholic knighthoods and whatever else, and it's this kind of warring faction. And the Jews are saying, well, we got this stuff to work out, and we got that stuff to work out. And the Catholics are going, oh, okay, well, we can give you that. We'll, we'll concede to this, and we'll allow that, and whatever else. But we, we want this. Well, no. They're going back and forth. They're ironing out the covenant as we speak. And when the Antichrist comes, he's going to confirm that covenant. And what does he do when he comes back? He goes out conquering and to conquer. Again, could that be the uh, thing that confirms the covenant? Where the Jews go, okay, yeah, good. You gave us your word that you'd wipe out all these Muslim nations. If you're a Muslim, you better get saved soon, please. Point number 22. Catholic mystics have been predicting a French king will restore Catholicism and destroy Islam bringing, before bringing in world peace. Okay? Um, let, me, let me just go over that real quickly here. I uh, have a thing here. Um, this is a Catholic website. And uh, talking about uh, the great, great monarch here. Um, Again, this thing of this French monarch, I, you know, and I don't know, some of these guys are just, you know, Catholic mystics are just kind of shooting out into the future. The Holy Spirit's not teaching them this stuff. It's devils and things. But they're also kind of telegraphing what their plans are event eventually going to be. Um, again, very interesting. Hippolytus, 235 A.D., says the great French monarch who shall subject all the East shall come around the end of the world. That predates Islam, Okay. This is before Islam even existed. But Hippolytus is saying he's going to subdue this French monarch that eventually comes is going to subdue all the East. And is basically going to rule the world. Hmm. And it's interesting that we have a Jesuit trained president right now in France. Emmanuel Macron. And Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. His name would be Emmanuel. Is it Macron? I have no idea. He's obviously not taking much of a stand against Islam right now. But, you know, could that, it, could that change eventually? Yeah. Could it be another man? Yeah. Does it have to be somebody from France? Well, I don't know. You know, these are, again, these are Catholic mystics saying this thing, so I don't put a lot of stock in the thing if it has to be some guy from France. That's not what I'm trying to prove by reading this. I'm trying to show, you know, I do believe that there will be this, this Catholic king that's coming and he wipes out the Muslims. Let's continue here. St. Methodius, 385 A.D., said, quote, A time will come when the enemies of Christ will boast. We have subjected the earth and all its inhabitants, and the Christians cannot escape our hands. Then a Roman emperor will rise in great fury against them, drawing his sword. He will fall upon the foes of Christianity and crush them. Then peace and quiet will reign on earth, and the priests will be relieved of all their anxieties. Interesting. I'm not going to read all these on here because some of them are just like, nah, I don't know about that. But uh, St. Caesar of Ares, 469 A.D., says, quote, When the entire world, and in a special manner France, and in France more particularly the provinces of the north, of the east, and above all that of Lorraine and Champagne, uh, shall have been a prey to the greatest miseries and trials, then the provinces shall be secured, helped, in other words, by a prince, who had been exiled in his youth, and who shall recover the crown of the lilies. This prince shall extend his dominion over the entire universe. At the same time there will be a great pope, who will be most eminent in sanctity and most perfect in every quality. This pope shall have with him the great monarch, a most virtuous man, who shall be a scion of the holy race of the French kings. Descendant, in other words. This great monarch will assist the Pope in the reformation of the whole earth. Many princes and nations that are living in error and in impiety shall be converted and admirable peace shall be appeased through their repentance, penance, and good works. There shall be one common law, only one only faith, one baptism, one religion. 
All nations shall recognize the Holy See of Rome and shall pay homage to the Pope. But after some considerable time, uh, fervor shall cool, iniquity shall abound, and moral corruption shall become worse than ever, which shall bring upon mankind the last and worst persecution of Antichrist and then the end of the world. Now here I thought to myself, because there's a couple of these mystics that say this, that there's going to be this crown and conquering Catholic king, and then the Antichrist shows up. And I'm going, this doesn't make any sense, you know, because the crown and conquering king is the Antichrist. I don't, I don't get it. And then it was just like, I do get it now. You know what they're trying to say by that? These mystics? And there's a couple, like I said, that say that. You're going to see it again here in just a little bit. What we as Christians call the Antichrist, they call their crowned and conquering king. And when Jesus comes back at the second time, the second coming, after the Antichrist and false prophet are there ruling and reigning and things for that time period, the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus comes back at the end of it. We call, we say, Jesus has come again. The Catholics are saying that that's the Antichrist. They're calling Jesus Christ the Antichrist, the son of perdition. You'll see that later on. A little bit blasphemous, huh? Okay. Worden di Otante, 1300 AD. The great monarch and the great pope will precede Antichrist. See it there again. They're saying that the the what we call the Antichrist is going to come, you know, and he'll be there. And then what we call Jesus Christ, they're calling the Antichrist. Just total satanic, just horrible stuff. The nations will be in wars for four years and a great part of the world will be destroyed. All the sects will vanish. The capital of the world will fall. The pope will go over the sea carrying the sign of redemption on his forehead Sign of redemption on his forehead? Hmm. You know, the Bible, Revelation chapter 20, talks about the mark of the beast being upon the forehead. In the right hand in the, or in the forehead in Revelation 13. But, uh, yeah, there and then also 14, chapter 14. But it says in Revelation 20 that it's also upon the forehead. This thing is saying that in 1300 AD, the Pope's going to have it upon his head. You know, the sign of redemption. Um, and after the victory of the Pope and the great monarch, peace will reign on earth. So they're actually saying that the that there's this too there, the Pope and the great monarch. You know, the Antichrist and the false prophet, you see. Those two are going to reign and there's going to bring great peace in after they defeat the Antichrist. Crazy. David Parius. Piraeus, I'm not sure how you say it, 1622 A.D. It says here, quote, The great monarch will be of French descent, large foreheaded, large dark eyes, light brown hair, and an eagle nose. He will crush the enemies of the Pope and will conquer the East. Same thing basically as Hippolytus said back in, you know, like the third century. Next we have Holzhauser, 1658 A.D. Quote, when everything has been ruined by war, when Catholics are hard-pressed by traitorous co-religionists and heretics, that would be me, <laughs> when the church and her servants are denied their rights, the monarchies have been abolished, and their rulers murdered, then the hand of Almighty God will, make, will work a marvelous change, something apparently impossible according to human understanding. There will arise a valiant monarch anointed by God. He will be a Catholic, a descendant of Louis the, the Ninth yet a descendant of an ancient imperial German family born in exile. He will rule supreme in temporal matters. You know, there you see the temporal thing again. The Pope will rule supreme in spiritual matters. Temporal, spiritual. Um, at the same time, persecution will cease and justice shall reign. Religion seems to be oppressed, but by the changes of entire kingdoms it will be made more firm. He will root out false doctrines and destroy the rule of Muslimism. That's what it says right here. His dominion will extend from the east to the west. All nations will adore God, their Lord, according to the Catholic teaching. There will be many wise and just men. The people will love justice and peace will reign over the whole earth. For divine power will bind Satan for many years until the coming of the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Again, they're saying that's Jesus Christ. Um, so then that's it for that. 
Um, then I'm going to read one more here. St. Francis de Paul, 1470 AD. Now this is a very long one, but very, very important. He says some really important stuff here to go along with this whole thing. All right. Um, it says here, quote, this is 1470. Remember this. From your leadership, Simeon de, Lim, de Mena, Lord of Montalto, shall be born the great leader of the holy militia of the Holy Spirit, which shall overcome the world and shall possess the earth so completely that no king or lord shall be able to exist except he belongs to the sacred host of the Holy Ghost. These devout men shall wear on their breasts and much uh, more within their hearts the sign of the living God, namely the cross. Look at some of the Roman Catholic orders and things. The Knights of the Equestrian Order, the, the Knights Templar, the Knights Malta, the Knights of Malta. You know, Sovereign Military Order of the Knights Malta, you know. Crazy. Uh, continuing here. The first mem members of this holy order, Templars, shall be natives of the city of, he leaves that blank, um, but at the very back of this thing, the very end of it, he says, in the first he emphasizes the city, which I guess is Jerusalem. So the writer of this thing is saying he this prophecy would be about Jerusalem. That's the city there. Where iniquity, vice, and sin abound. However, they shall be converted from evil to good, from rebels against God. They shall become more, most fervent and most faithful in his divine service. That city shall be cherished by God and by the great monarch, monarch the elect and the, most, and the beloved of the Most High Lord. For the sake of that place, all holy souls who have done penance and it shall pray in the sight of God for the city and for its inhabitants. When the time shall come of the immense and most right justice of the Holy Spirit, His divine majesty wills that such city become converted to God and that many of its citizens follow the great prince of the holy army. The first person that will openly wear the sign of the living God shall belong to that city because he will through a letter be commanded by a holy hermit to have it impressed in his heart and to wear it externally on his breast. Again, the Knights of the Equestrian Order, they're wearing these, these crosses, the Jerusalem cross, the Templars. They're, all these Catholics are wearing these crosses, and they're all talking about taking over the city. Again, the covenant, the treaty, whereby Israel is giving their lands to the Vatican. It's already happening. You see? It's already happening. And the Jews... You know, they're going to have to sign, if they sign this covenant and things, and they, they confirm, you know, this, they, they go along with this, there has to be a real big price that the Catholics are going to have to pay, a real big uh, wager, you know, so to speak. And I believe firmly that's going to be the destruction of the Islamic nations, just totally wiping out the Muslims. I think that's what it's going to be, a, a major, massive crusade. Continuing here, quote, That man will begin to meditate on the secrets of God about the long visitation which the Holy Spirit will make and the dominion that he will exercise over the world through the holy militia. O happy man who shall receive from the Most High the greatest privileges. He will interpret the hidden secrets of the Holy Ghost and he shall often excite the admiration of men by his revealed knowledge of the internal secrets of their hearts. Rejoice, my Lord, because that prince above other princes and king over other kings is the Catholic ruler that's coming, taking Jesus' title from Revelation 19. Will hold you in the greatest veneration, and after having been crowned with three most admirable crowns, will exalt that city, Jerusalem, will declare it free and the seat of the empire, and shall become one of the first cities of the world, the city of the great king. Matthew chapter 5. 1470. Catholics saying that this is what's going to happen. Continuing, you and your consort desire to have children, you shall have them. Your holy offspring shall be admired upon earth. Among your descendants there will be one who shall be like the sun amidst the stars. He shall be a firstborn son. In his childhood he will be like a saint, in his youth a great sinner. Then he will be converted entirely to God and will do great penance. His sins will be forgiven him and he shall become a great saint. He shall be a great captain and prince of holy men, who shall be called the holy cross-bearers of Jesus Christ, with whom he shall destroy the Mohammedan sect and the rest of the infidels. Just show this to you here, this portion right there. Okay? 
I'm reading it word for word, brethren. He shall reform the church of God by means of his followers, who shall be the best men upon earth in holiness, in arms, in science. A high-tech army, written about in 1470. Hmm. And in every virtue, because such is the will of the Most High, they shall obtain the dominion of the whole world, both temporal and spiritual, and they shall support the church of God until the end of time. God Almighty will exalt a very poor man of the blood of the Emperor Constantine, son of St. Helena, and of the seed of Pepin, who shall on his breast wear the sign which you have seen at the beginning of this letter. Uh, through the power of the Most High, he shall confound the tyrants, the heretics, and the infidels. He will gather a grand army, and the angels shall fight for them. They shall kill all God's enemies. Right there. Hmm. From the beginning of the world, after the creation of man, and to the end of human generation, there have been and there shall be seen wonder, wonderful events upon the earth. Four hundred years shall not pass when His Divine Majesty shall visit the world with a new religious order much needed, which shall affect more good among men than all other religious institutions combined. It's funny because, you know, devout Catholics are calling for that exact thing. We need a new religious order. We need a new, you know, we can't go back pre-Vatican II, you know, but we want something new. That We need this great new Catholic Church. Continuing here. This religious order shall be the last and the best in the Church. It shall proceed with arms. Again, back in the book of Daniel. He comes in peaceably and obtains the kingdom by flatteries, the Antichrist. And he goes out, you know, and by peace he'll destroy many. Woe to tyrants, to heretics, and to infidels, to whom no pity shall be shown, because such is the will of the Most High. An infinite number of wicked men shall perish through the hands of the cross-bearers, the true servants of Jesus Christ. They shall act like good husbandmen when they extirpate noxious weeds and prickly thistles from the wheat field. These holy servants of God shall purify the earth with the deaths of innumerable wicked men. Let me just show you that again, just so you see I'm... Not making this up. Right there. The highlighted parts. Really something. How spiritually blind are those persons who, having no thought about the things of God, fix their end in earthly objects. Wretched men, far worse than the very beasts which are guided by their senses, because they cannot have reason. But when men abandon the use of their reason, they become brutalized. Hence they shall ever be in confusion. Let therefore the princes of this world be prepared for the greatest scourges to fall upon them. But from whom? First from heretics and infidels, then from the holy and most faithful cross-bearers, elected by the Most High, who not succeeding in converting heretics with science, hmm, shall have to make a vigorous use of their arms. Many cities and villages shall be in ruins, with the deaths of, innumer of an innumerable quantity of bad and good men, the infidels, Muslims, in other words, also will fight against Christians and heretics, sacking and destroying and killing the largest portion of Christians. Lastly, the army styled of the church, namely the Holy Cross bearers, shall move not against Christians or Christianity, but against the infidels in pagan countries, and they shall conquer all those kingdoms with the death of a very great number of infidels. After this, they shall turn their victorious arms against bad Christians. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm going to be here for this, but the point is, and shall destroy all the rebels against Jesus Christ. These holy cross bearers shall reign and dominate totally over the world until the end of time. The founder of these men, holy men, shall, my Lord, be one of your posterity. But when shall this take place? When crosses with the stigmas shall be seen, when the and the crucifix shall be carried as the standard. The time is coming when His Divine Majesty will visit the world with a new religious order of holy cross bearers who will carry a crucifix or the image of our crucified Lord lifted up upon the principal standard in view of all. This standard will be admired by all good Catholics, but at the beginning it will be derided by bad Christians and by infidels. Interesting, because you have this group, Britain First, and they go through Muslim areas and things like this, and they're carrying these big crosses.
given time, they're going to be going out and killing. The sneers shall, in other words, the, the Muslims and heretics like me, when we look at that and go, brother, you know. The sneers shall, however, be changed into mourning when they shall witness the wonderful victories achieved through it. Many wicked men and obstinate rebels against God shall perish. Their souls will be plunged into hell. This puni punishment shall fall upon all those transgressors of the divine commandments who with new and false doctrines will attempt to corrupt mankind and turn men against the ministers of God's worship. The same chastisement is due to all obstinate sinners, but not to those who sin through weakness, because these being converted, doing penance, and amending the conduct of their life, shall find the divine mercy of the Most High full of kindness towards them. O holy cross-bearers of the Most High Lord, how very pleasing you will be to the great God, much more than the children of Israel. God will, through your instrumentality, work more wonderful prodigies than he has ever done before you, before with any nation. Yeah, so they're going to start out being friendly and confirming this covenant with the Jews, and then after the Muslims are wiped out and the Christians are gone and things and the heretics are very much lower in number, then they're going to turn on the Jews as well. They'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And the Antichrist says, you worship me now. Yeah. But continuing here, he says, You shall destroy the sect of Muhammad and all infidels of every kind and of every sect. You shall put an end to all the heresies of the world by extinguishing all tyrants. You will remove every cause of complaint by establishing a universal peace which shall last until the end of time, until the Antichrist. Hmm. You will work the sanctification of mankind, O holy men, people blessed of the most holy trinity. Your victorious founder shall triumph over the world, the flesh, and the devil. One of your posterity shall achieve greater deeds and work greater wonders than your lordship. That man will be a great sinner in his youth, but like St. Paul, he shall be converted to God. He shall be the great founder of a new religious order different from all the others. He shall divide it into three classes, namely, military knights, solitary priests, and most pious, pious hospitallers. The order of the hospitallers is the, I think, Knights of Malta created that whole thing. It's where your modern-day hospitals come from and all the problems associated with it. This shall be the last religious order in the church, and it will be it will do more good for our holy religion than all other religious institutes. By force of arms, he shall take possession of a great kingdom. He shall destroy the sect of Muhammad, uh, extirpate all tyrants and heresies. He shall bring the world to a holy mode of life. There will be one fold and one shepherd. He shall reign until the end of time. On the whole earth, there shall be only 12 kings, one emperor, and one pope. Rich gentlemen shall be very few, but all saints. May Jesus Christ be praised and blessed, for he has vouched to grant to me, a poor unworthy sinner, um, the spirit of prophecy, not in an obscure way as to his other servants, or as the Bible. Okay, No pride there, but has enabled me to write and to speak in a most clear manner. I know that unbelieving and reprobate persons will scoff at my letters and will reject them, um, but they will be received... Uh, but they will he receive by those. Well, they, but they will be received by those faithful Catholic souls who aspire to the possession of heaven. These letters shall infuse such. Almost done here. Sweetness of divine love in their hearts, that they will be delighted in pursuing them often and in taking copies of them, because such is the will of the Most High. Okay. Wow. But check this out. This is very interesting. And these letters, it will be found out who belongs to our blessed Lord Jesus Christ and who does not. What's that sound like? Who belongs to the Lord and who doesn't? Calvinism. The elect and the non-elect. You say, oh, come on, you're stretching it. Pay attention to this. Who is a predestinate or a reprobate? 1470, a Catholic mystic writes who is a predestinate or who is a reprobate. Where did John Calvin get his ideas from? Right there, you see it. Hmm. Much better will this be known through the holy sign of the living God. He shall be a saint of God who will take it, love it, and wear it. 
Interesting. Very, very, very telling. Finish up here. There's a couple other things, little points I want to make, and then I'm done. Uh, number point number 24. John Ronald Rule Tolkien. His final book was The Return of the King. I did a whole thing showing quotes from his books and everything else. I, I can't go into all that stuff. I burned the books anyhow because they're satanic. But um, he got into this whole thing. His vision. He understood a lot of this stuff that was being planned. A lot of this stuff that the mystic Catholics were, were talking about. And his desire was to see this crowned and conquering king that would rule and reign the holy city and bring peace. After wiping out the hordes of orcs, the Muslims, and the Protestants. Hmm. That's exactly what they're trying to depict. All the different types of Catholics and things and some of the, you know, separated brethren among the Protestants that come back under the authority of Rome. And when the time's right, now we're going to go in there and we're going to wipe out all those Muslims and any, any other heretics that stand in our way. And they're going to do it as part of that covenant to the Jews. I firmly believe that. In exchange for the Jews, they get the temple there on Fort Antonia, but the Catholics have the rights to it. Hmm. They'll make a deal with Satan to the Jews, I'm saying. Satan being the Catholic Church. But another little interesting piece of, of uh, information here. Did you know that John Ronald Rule Tolkien, I said this in another one of my videos, did you know that he was on a translation team behind the Jerusalem Bible? He translated part of that work. The Jerusalem Bible that has on the front cover the cross of the Knights of the Equestrian Order. Hmm. How about that? So, you know, and, and there's, I just have here, the Knights of the Equestrian Order is headquartered in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's actually not true. The headquarters is in Rome, but they are there in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at, in Jerusalem, right near the Temple Mount. They are supposed to, if you're a Knight of the Equestrian Order, you are supposed to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem at some point in time. And you'll see these, they have the, the insignia of the Jerusalem cross on their arm, here kind of on their upper arm like this. And you'll see some, they'll have a seashell with the Jerusalem cross on, in the middle of the seashell. That means that they have taken the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I mean, there's, there's some real deep stuff going on here. And, uh, but, you know, I just wanted to put this thing out there. And, and I know this is a pretty, pretty deep type of a thing. But I just want to get people's responses to this. Um, for me, the thing that really sells me on this whole idea is, number one, Watching that documentary, there is no possible way that the second temple was built up there on the current, what they call Temple Mount. Um, Jesus did not lie. He said there wouldn't be one stone upon another. They'd all be thrown down. Uh, that western wall is not part of the Temple Mount. It's Fort Antonia, a Roman fort. That's why the Romans have the ability to say, hey, we're going to say what goes on that Temple Mount. But see, they stand back in the in the shadows and they just they're the synthesis you see and so they have the thesis the jews the antithesis the muslims they're the synthesis they come in they say we're just going to eliminate that the muslims i firmly believe that again they've already been doing this thing don't tell me oh come on brother brian you're just stretching things what do you think the crusades have been about since 2001 the crusade against iraq the crusade against afghanistan against all these other countries, these Islamic countries, Syria and stuff like this, bombing Lebanon and everything else. They've already killed hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Islamic people. But they haven't kicked in their real plan yet. The real death and destruction is yet to come. I mean, again, well, yeah, but Brother Brian, I just don't think that you're proving the point. Okay, they signed the peace treaty. Let's just go with the traditional teaching Sign the peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims, the Arabic peoples and stuff like this, the descendants of Isaac, the descendants of Ishmael. What are the Jews able to give up that the Muslims want? They have nothing to give up. 
The Muslims want them dead. They want them out of the land. What's the point of that? We'll give you the Temple Mount to build your temple on, but you can't stay in the land of Israel. Doesn't make any sense at all. And again, if that happens, the Antichrist comes, he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Who? If he's not going out to conquer Islam, who's he conquering? North Korea or something like that? Doesn't make any sense. I know this kind of takes some rewiring of the brain, you know, because we've all been taught this thing for so long that, you know, this peace treaty has to happen between the Jews and the Muslims. But brethren, I don't see it. Show it to me in the scriptures. I mean, educate me. I'm open to correction. Somebody can show me the scriptures that say that it's going to be the Jews and the Muslims that this peace treaty is signed between. Show it to me. But until then, until I'm shown that I'm wrong in this theory, I'm going to believe and I'm going to teach from now on that this covenant that's being confirmed is right here. It's already written up. They're already working it out. And they're stringing the Muslims along, making them think that they might actually get their land back or whatever else, or some concessions. Well, you can't build down there. Well, we can, you know, it's a smokescreen till the time is right. And I think, really, I think that the trigger for the real war against Islam is going to be the rapture. The body of Christ goes up. The Catholic news media goes, look at this. These stinking Muslims, look what they did. we got to start the crusade. Some Catholics go, oh, I don't know. All of a sudden, <whistles> Marian apparitions up there. Some world leader shows up. Hey, I think we need to, to, to really fight against Islam now. They go out and they start slaughtering the Muslims. Or else they blow up the Dome of the Rock. They blow up Mecca and Medina. And they say to the Muslims, the white men did it. Those Catholics did it. You think the Catholic Church is going to protect the lower down Catholics? You're crazy. <laughs> they could care less. It's all political maneuvering and political scheming and things like that. If they have to lose, you know, 20 million Catholics, well, yeah, whatever. They don't care. Again, if you're Roman Catholic, you need to think about that. The hierarchy does not care. You know? So, uh, that's going to be it for this video. Um, a lot of stuff to get out there, but uh, let me know what you think. Um, that's going to be it. Thank you for watching. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days Thursday, Friday, happy days Saturday, the Sabbath day There's so much you can't do These are the Sabbath hours the Sabbath day Satan wants them to be sour the Sabbath day Sky, hello blue. The Sabbath day is made for you. Day of rest, fellowship too. So much joy for you to choose. The Sabbath days are yours and mine. Oh, happy day! The Sabbath days are yours and mine. Oh, happy day! Sabbath days are yours and mine. Sabbath days are yours and mine. Happy days.